Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today, Dan Friedel tells us about one company's attempt to launch a rocket made of 3D printed materials. John Russell presents this week's Everyday Grammar Report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series, "The Making of a Nation." But first. Vietnam has enjoyed a wave of investment from China since its northern neighbor ended its zero COVID policy late last year. Chinese companies invested in 45 new projects in the first 50 days of 2023. Vietnamese government data showed major foreign companies, including Samsung. Canon and Honhai, the maker of Apple iPhones, already had factories in Vietnam, but supplies for many still largely came from China. Industry experts say the new investors are mostly smaller suppliers to larger companies that were already established in Vietnam. The move is related to the rising cost of labor in China, in addition to expanding U.S. restrictions on high-tech trade with China. Those smaller firms offering supplies and services to larger companies with facilities already in Vietnam now make up most of the Chinese companies investing in Vietnam. For example. In Vietnam's solar panel industry, there has been an increase of small suppliers to provide materials and services such as plastic molding, die casting, and energy storage. Last year, Chinese panel maker suppliers were behind two of the main investments in Vietnam in ready-made factories, says the CBRE Group. Such factories are often favored by smaller firms when entering new countries. Chinese electronics, robotics, and home appliance firms were also among the top spenders on industrial leases in Vietnam last year. The data showed. Others included flooring firms, glass makers. And suppliers of cartons and parts for Apple devices, said Do Hong Quan, head of Vietnam Investment Consulting. As manufacturers worldwide still struggle to normalize because of the pandemic, Chinese firms have spent two hundred fifty million dollars more on new factories in Vietnam as compared to the same period a year earlier. Official data showed that is second only to investment from Singapore, and more than traditionally bigger investors such as South Korea and Japan. Making the move to Vietnam is not without risks for Chinese businesses. The two countries have a long and bloody history, and today China and Vietnam. Are among several countries that have competing claims in the waters and islands in the South China Sea. And in 2014, anti-Chinese sentiment caused Vietnamese rioters to target Chinese factories. Investment applications from Chinese firms tend to be studied with extra care, resulting in delays or rejections. Chinese firms also experience longer wait times to get visas and permits for workers," said Filippo Bortoletti. He is with the investment consultant firm Dazan Shira. However, such risks are not enough to keep small suppliers away.
A rocket made almost entirely of 3D printed parts started its first flight late Wednesday, but failed to reach orbit. The 33-meter-long rocket, called Terran-1, took off from Cape Canaveral, Florida. The startup company, Relativity Space, created 85% of the rocket using 3D printing technology. Most parts came from the company's large printing center in Long Beach, California. Terran 1 took off successfully and stayed in the air for three minutes. The first stage, or lower part of the rocket, launched and separated as planned. The upper stage, however, appeared to ignite and then shut down, sending it crashing into the Atlantic Ocean. Relativity Space had hoped for the rocket to stay in orbit for several days before falling through Earth's atmosphere and burning up. It was the second failed launch by Relativity Space this month. The company called off an attempt 12 days ago, just seconds before takeoff. Though the rocket did not reach orbit, the company said it was pleased with the launch. Arwa Tizani Kelly works for Relativity Space and discussed the launch. Kelly said that first launches are always exciting, and today's flight was no exception. Although other space businesses use 3D printed materials, the pieces make up only a small part of their rockets. Relativity Space was founded in 2015 by two young engineers. The company said it is working to develop larger versions of the rocket that will have even more 3D printed material. I'm Dan Friedel. Imagine a teacher says the following to you during an English speaking test. Tell me about where you live. Can you describe your living space? Today's report will explore ways to answer such a question. We will talk about nouns, verbs, and prepositions that can help us give a detailed, clear answer and earn a good score on the test. Let's start with some important terms and ideas. In an earlier Everyday Grammar report, we explored how you can talk about where you live in general terms. We learned about how to talk about a neighborhood or a part of a city. In today's report, we will explore how to talk about the exact place where you live. When we talk about where we live, a number of nouns, verbs, and prepositions become important. The nouns are limited in number. There are three important nouns we often use to talk about living spaces. House, apartment, and room. We will explore more about these nouns later. In terms of verbs, we often describe living places in two ways. We use verbs to show how we pay for the living space. Important verbs related to finances include own, rent, or share. So we might say, they own their house, or she rents her apartment, or we share an apartment. We also use verbs to describe the contents or objects of the living space. Important verbs related to objects or contents include have. So, for example, a person might say, The apartment has three rooms. We can also talk about the exact objects in a room with have. For example, a person could say, the bedroom has a bed, a fan, and a desk, 
or the bathroom has a shower, a sink, and a toilet. Finally, we arrive at prepositions. These are short words that place nouns in space. When we talk about living spaces, the preposition in is probably the most important. We say, I live in a house, or I live in an apartment, for example. When we talk about objects or locations, we often say, in the kitchen, or in the bathroom, or in the bedroom. So a person might say, the stove is in the kitchen, or a sink is in the bathroom. So, we have three important ingredients for talking about our living spaces. Nouns, verbs, and prepositions. How do we put all of them together? Let's start with something we heard at the beginning of our report. Tell me about where you live. You could respond to this by saying, for example, I live in a house. Or... I live in an apartment. Or... I rent a room in a house. Or... I share an apartment. Or you might say... I own a house. Now consider how you might answer the following. Tell me about where you live. Can you describe your living space? You might say... I live in an apartment. The apartment has four rooms. Two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a living room. I share a room with my sister. Or you might say... I rent a room in a house. The room has a bed, a desk, a closet, and a bookshelf. Today... We explored some ways to describe a living space. There are, of course, many other ways to do so. You might use other nouns, verbs, or prepositions. But as a starting point, the small set of nouns, verbs, and prepositions we talked about today can be very useful. Let's end this report with a homework assignment. Write to us about a living space. It can be either real or imaginary. Try to use some of the terms that we explored today, but be sure to use some new ones, too. You just heard this week's Everyday Grammar Report, presented by John Russell. Now, John joins me to talk a little bit more about the lesson. Hi, John. Welcome back. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for having me on the show. You described how a small number of nouns, verbs, and prepositions can be used when talking about a living space. You didn't mention adjectives. What are some common adjectives we can use to describe living spaces? That's a great question. I would say that probably the most common kinds of adjectives we use to describe living spaces are the adjectives big and small. So, for example, a person can say that they live in a small house or a big apartment. That's right. We can also use big and small to describe the rooms in a living space. You might say, the kitchen is big, or the bedroom is small. You could also use these adjectives to describe the contents of a room. For example, the living room has a big television, or the kitchen has a small stove. That's right. There are, of course, other kinds of adjectives we could use. But for starters, big and small are two nice, useful words. Well, thanks for that advice, John, and thanks for speaking with us today. You're welcome. See you next time. Welcome to The Making of a Nation. American History in VOA Special English. The United States Constitution guarantees freedoms such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of religion. The Bill of Rights in the Constitution 
protects these and other individual rights. But the government has not always honored all of the rights in the Constitution. In the 1700s, for example, President John Adams supported laws to stop Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Party from criticizing the government. During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln took strong actions to prevent newspapers from printing military news. And during the 1950s, Senator Joseph McCarthy accused innocent people of being communists and traitors. Some of the most serious government attacks on personal rights took place in 1919 and 1920. A number of government officials took sometimes unlawful actions against labor leaders, foreigners, and others. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe discussed the campaign that came to be known as the Red Scare. These actions took place because of American fears about the threat of communism. Those fears were tied closely to the growth of the organized labor movement during World War I. There were a number of strikes during the war. More and more often, workers were willing to risk their jobs and join together to try to improve working conditions. President Woodrow Wilson had long supported organized labor, and he tried to get workers and business owners to negotiate peacefully. But official support for organized labor ended when strikes closed factories that were important to the national war effort. President Wilson and his advisors felt workers should put the national interest before their private interest. They told workers to wait until after the war to demand more pay and better working conditions. In general, American workers did wait. But when the war finally ended in 1918, American workers began to strike in large numbers for higher pay. As many as two million workers went on strike in 1919. There were strikes by house builders, meat cutters, and train operators. And there were strikes in the shipyards, the shoe factories, and the telephone companies. Most striking workers wanted the traditional goals of labor unions, more pay and shorter working hours. But a growing number of them also began to demand major changes in the economic system itself. They called for government control of certain private industries. Railroad workers, for example, wanted the national government to take permanent control of running the trains. Coal miners, too, demanded government control of their industry. And even in the conservative grain-farming states... 200,000 farmers joined a group that called for major economic changes. All these protests came as a shock to traditional Americans who considered their country to be the home of free business. They saw little need for labor unions, and they feared that the growing wave of strikes meant the United States faced the same revolution that had just taken place in Russia. After all, Lenin himself had warned that the Bolshevik Revolution would spread to workers in other countries. Several events in 1919 only increased this fear 
a violent revolution. A bomb exploded in the home of a senator from the southeastern state of Georgia. And someone even exploded a bomb in front of the home of Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, the nation's chief law officer. However, the most frightening event was a strike by police in Boston, Massachusetts. The policemen demanded higher wages, but the police chief refused to negotiate with them. As a result, the policemen went on strike. When they did, thieves began to break into unprotected homes and shops. Massachusetts Governor Calvin Coolidge finally had to call out state troops to protect the people. His action defeated the strike. Most of the policemen lost their jobs. All this was too much for many Americans. They began to accuse labor unions and others of planning a revolution. And they launched a forceful campaign to protect the country from these suspected extremists. Leaders of this campaign accused thousands of people of being communists or reds. The campaign became known as the Red Scare. Of course, most people were honestly afraid of revolution. They did not trust the many foreigners who were active in unions, and they were tired of change and social unrest after the bloody World War. A number of these Americans in different cities began to take violent actions against people and groups that they suspected of being communist extremists. In New York, a crowd of men in military uniforms attacked the office of a socialist newspaper. They beat the people working there and destroyed the equipment. In the western city of Centralia, Washington, four people were killed in a violent fight between union members and their opponents. Public feeling was against the labor unions and political leftists. Many people considered anyone with leftist views to be a revolutionary trying to overthrow democracy. Many state and local governments passed laws making it a crime to belong to organizations that supported revolution. Twenty-eight states passed laws making it a crime to wave red flags. People also demanded action from the national government. President Wilson was sick and unable to see the situation clearly. He cared about little except his dream of the United States joining the new League of Nations. But Attorney General Palmer heard the calls for action. Palmer hoped to be elected president the next year. He decided to take strong actions to gain the attention of voters. One of Palmer's first actions as Attorney General was to prevent coal miners from going on strike. Next, he ordered a series of raids to arrest leftist leaders. A number of these arrested people were innocent of any crime, but officials kept many of them in jail without charges for weeks. Palmer expelled from the country a number of foreigners suspected of revolutionary activity. He told reporters that communists were criminals who planned to overthrow everything that was good in life. 
Feelings of fear and suspicion extended to other parts of American life. Many persons and groups were accused of supporting communism. Such famous Americans as actor Charlie Chaplin, educator John Dewey, and law professor Felix Frankfurter were among those accused. The Red Scare caused many innocent people to be afraid to express their ideas. They feared they might be accused of being a communist. But as quickly as the Red Scare swept across the country, so too did it end in 1920. In just a few months, people began to lose trust in Attorney General Palmer. They became tired of his extreme actions. Republican leader Charles Evans Hughes and other leading Americans called for the Justice Department to obey the law in arresting and charging people. By the summer of 1920, the Red Scare was over. Even a large bomb explosion in New York in September did not change the opinion of most Americans that the nation should return to free speech and the rule of law. The Red Scare did not last long, but it was an important event. It showed that many Americans, after World War I, were tired of social changes. They wanted peace and business growth. Of course, the traditional way for Americans to show their feelings is through elections. And this growing conservatism of the nation showed itself clearly in the presidential election of 1920.